welcome to the first episode of The Naked Photo. My name is Rian de Beer. I am a fine art landscape photographer and my passion is making photos. In today's episode we are going to discuss one of my all-time favorite photographs by one of my all-time favorite photographers. That is The Monolith by Ansel Adams. If you had to think of a photograph made by Ansel Adams, you would probably think of this image. It's one of his most iconic photographs. But more importantly than that, this photograph was a key breakthrough moment for Ansel. He had spent many seasons in Yosemite working on capturing the majesty and beauty of that valley before he made this image. And up until this image, he had always felt that his photographs did not quite capture what the place felt like in real life. As a young man, Ansel was a bit of a misfit, and he was an academic failure. But he had a deeply committed father who took him out of school at the age of 12 and nurtured his young mind with homeschooling in San Francisco. Ansel discovered music as a teenager, and he poured his soul into piano music and his one other passion, mountain hikes in Yosemite. He started taking a camera with him on those hikes in 1920, and the intention was to make snapshots. But he was very disappointed by how little of what he had seen and felt at the time of the capture was actually caught in those photographs. Now, Ansel was a man who was capable of intense energy and commitment when he put his mind to something. And luckily for us, he was frustrated enough with the results of those photographs that he set out to learn as much as he could about the photographic process. Initially, in terms of style, he tried to adopt a pictorialist style, which was the dominant photographic fashion at that time. I suppose if you had to define pictorialism in one sentence, one could say that it was... Uh, an attempt to get photography recognized as an art by making photos look painterly. Ansel tried this style, but for him, the work remained unsatisfying. And more importantly, it still remained without any real sense of purpose or direction. What it came down to is that Ansel was still trying to find his own voice. Over time, he became aware of the modern movement in photography and his style slowly began to shift towards a more direct and clean style of photography. But his frustration with being unable to capture what he felt remained. Later in his life he was quoted for saying this about landscape photography. He said, landscape photography is the supreme test of the photographer and often the supreme disappointment. Ansel's first great leap forward uh, in developing his own personal style came from an experience he had in 1923. Uh, while climbing the mountains in Yosemite, he had what some people would call a spiritual or even a religious experience in the mountains. And it's best described in his own words. He writes, I was climbing a long ridge west of Mount Clark. It was one of those mornings when the sunlight is burnished with a keen wind and long feathers of clouds move in a lofty sky. The silver light turned every blade of grass and every particle of sand into a luminous metallic splendor. There was nothing, no matter how small, that did not clash with the bright air, that did not send arrows of light into the glassy air. I was suddenly arrested in the long crunching path to the ridgeway by an exceedingly pointed awareness of the light. The moment I paused, the full impact of the mood was upon me. I saw more clearly than before or ever since the minute details of the grasses, the small flotsam of the forest, the motion of the high clouds streaming above the peaks. I dreamed that for a moment time stood quietly, and the vision became but a shadow of an infinitely greater world, and I had within the grasp of consciousness 
a transcendental experience. Ansel would spend the rest of his life trying to capture that crystal clear silver light he saw that morning. And four years after this moment, he had his first major breakthrough. And that is the picture that we're discussing today. Before we get too far into the events of April 17, 1927, when he took this photograph, I want to take a moment to just paint the picture of what a photographic mountain hike was like for Ansel. You know, in our digital age, we imagine a hike being a walk with comfortable boots and a backpack, and maybe with a relatively small and lightweight set of gear. Ansel used a 6.5 by 8.5 Corona large format view camera with glass plate negatives. On the morning of this hike, he also had two lenses and two glass filters and a rather heavy wooden tripod. He carried 12 glass plate negatives in a separate case and he climbed the roughly two and a half thousand feet without any ropes or any assistance. So it's early in the morning on April 17, 1927. It's a Sunday morning. And he sets out on a hike up to what they called the diving board with his wife and some friends from the Sierra Club. The diving board is this rocky ledge at an elevation of about 4,000 feet on the western side of the mountain. And it gave an unobstructed view of the half dome. And his intention this morning is to make photographs of the half dome. He has his 12 negatives. This was going to be all his negatives for a whole day in the mountains. So he had to be pretty careful about what he was going to photograph. Because once he exposed all those plates, that was it for the day. This was a pretty slow and laborious process. And getting a good photograph this way took a lot of time and commitment. I think that's why Ansel said that 12 significant photographs in any one year is a good crop. Imagine that. He hoped for one good photograph a month. So Ansel's climbing the mountain with his wife and friends. He makes some photos on the way up. Uh, some of Mount Clark, some of his wife. Some of them he has to expose two or three times because the wind keeps shaking the view camera and that destroys the sharpness of the image. It's a difficult climb. But by the time that he gets to the diving board, which is really the point of the whole climb, it's about noon and he has only two unexposed glass plates left. The face of the mountain is in the shade at this time of the day. So they settle down, they rest, and they wait for a few hours, watching the slow creeping of the sun across the edge of the monolith. By mid-afternoon, Ansel sets up his camera on the ledge. He's extremely limited by the location. There's a sheer drop on his left hand side and there's a lot of brush and rocks on his right hand. He inserts a first glass plate and removes the light proof slide that covers it and makes the first exposure with a yellow K2 filter over the lens. I'll tell what happens next in his own words. He says, as I replace the slide, I realized that the image would not carry the qualities I was aware of when I made the exposure. The majesty of the sculptural shape of the dome in the solemn effect of the half sunlight and the half shadow would not, I thought, be properly conveyed using the K2 filter. I had only one plate left and was aware of my poverty. I saw the photograph as a brooding form with deep shadows and a distant sharp white peak against a dark sky. The only way I could represent this adequately was to use my deep red Rattan number 29 filter, hoping it would produce the effect I visualized. With the Rattan panchromatic plate I was using, this filter reduced the exposure by a factor of 16. I attached the filter with great care, inserted the plate holder, set the shutter, and pulled the slide. I knew I had an exceptional possibility at my grasp. I checked everything again, then pressed the shutter release for the five second exposure at f22. Because the lens barely covered the plate, I was obliged to use a small lens stop, but fortunately there was no wind to disturb the camera during the long exposure. I most carefully inserted the slide 
and wrap the plate holders in my focusing cloth for protection against the roughness of the long hike home. I saw many gorgeous photographs on the way down, but could do nothing about them being out of place. This photograph represents my first conscious visualization. In my mind's eye, I saw with reasonable completeness the final image as made with the red filter. The resulting image is astonishing. The sky is darker than the mountain. The sheer face of the mountain seems to loom up terrifyingly and massive. Ansel says afterwards, For the first time, I made a mountain look the way it feels. A massive, monumental thing. There's this common myth that Ansel did realistic landscapes. And that what we see in his photographs was what the, what the scene really looked like. Nothing can be further from the truth. He was not interested in objective documentary photography. And to put him in the category of a documentary photographer is to miss the real strength of his photographs. He was interested in showing how the place felt, and he would manipulate the negative in the darkroom until he achieved it. It really is a credit to his ability in the darkroom that people think of his photographs as documentary photographs. Ansel had spent years perfecting his craft and he was a master of the printmaking process. He would dodge and burn his images heavily. He would spend days in the darkroom working an image until he had it perfect. He described it using the analogy of music. He said the negative was like the music score written by the composer and the print is like the performance by the musician. He would practice his performance until it was perfect before he revealed it to the world. People who saw him in the darkroom commented that he would move and dance in front of the enlarger like a conductor in front of an orchestra, adding and removing light to the image until it was a perfect representation of his vision. And that vision of his was not static, it changed over time, and the way he printed an image would change over time with it. He commented on how later in life, when he printed the monolith again, that he approached it differently and that his later reproductions he felt more closely resembled his vision of the day.